Good morning. <clears throat> we will call this uh, uh, committee hearing to order. The committee is in the midst of an effort to enact comprehensive reform of government contracting to help small businesses. And our efforts began with 10 hearings on contracting topics. And this was followed by the introduction of eight contracting bills supported by over 20 trade associations. And last week, this committee uh, supported, or last week, this committee marked up four of those bills plus two additional bills um, introduced by the minority. And this week, we are going to mark up the remaining four bills plus a bill. Uh, introduced by the ranking member. And I believe this is a, a testament to the importance of government contracting for small business, and I think it is a tribute uh, to the bipartisan nature of this committee. Um, while we are going to briefly discuss each of the bills individually before we mark it up, I want to emphasize how important these issues are to small businesses and taxpayers. The Federal Government regularly spends over half a trillion dollars on Federal contracts each year and has spent over $100 billion so far this year. When small businesses compete, compete for those contracts, something important happens. We get jobs created, innovation occurs, competition brings down prices. So in short, when small businesses win, we all win. Today we are examining some of the key issues for small businesses, such as who is actually small. We are making sure that the programs intended to help small businesses deliver results and don't inadvertently harm the very businesses they are uh, supposed to help. And we are halting some unjustified contract bundling, which will result in more competition. We are standardizing the assistance we provide to the subcategories of small businesses, and we are protecting the taxpayers against fraud. All of these issues deserve support, and I look forward to working with all of you today to move these bills uh, one step closer to becoming law. I now recognize uh, Ranking Member Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Small businesses continue to be at the center of the economy, creating nearly two-thirds of net employment gains. Seizing on this job creating power is essential to move the economy forward. As a result, it is important that we help lay the foundation for their success. One way to do this is to provide entry for small enterprises into the Federal procurement marketplace. As a $500 billion market for goods and services, the government buys everything from paper to furniture to aircraft carriers. At every point in this procurement process, Small firms should have an opportunity to compete for the government's business. Unfortunately, this vision is far from reality. The government continues to struggle to meet the 23 percent goal for small firms and has not even come close to achieving the 5 percent goal for women-owned businesses. Fraud in contracting programs continues to increase as contracts are still being channeled to ineligible companies. And finally, Contract bundling and consolidations remain a key problem, and small businesses lack the tools and resources to fight back. Tackling these problems is the right thing to do, and I am hopeful that the legislation we consider today will take steps in the right direction. In this regard, I want to thank the Chairman for continuing to work with us in a bipartisan manner on these bills. And I thank the Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Okay, we'll be marking. <coughs> All right, we'll be marking up uh, the five contracting bills. We're going to do it in the order that they were um, that we noticed them out as. The first bill is HR 3985, uh, the Building Better Business Partnerships Act of 2012. It was introduced by Mr. Schilling and Ms. Chu. Uh, I now yield to Mr. Schilling uh, to speak on 3985. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member uh, Velasquez. I want to thank Representative Chu for her work on H.R. 3985 and the efforts of the committee to reform the federal contracting process. I have owned my small pizzeria for more than 15 years and understand firsthand how difficult and uh, basically limiting some federal programs can be for small business owners to navigate and uh, access through. Contracting with the federal government is really no different. I have heard from numerous job creators in my district about how valuable winning and retaining federal contracts are uh, to growing their business and how the end result affects men and women they employ. Most recently in Milan, Illinois, we helped uh, a gentleman navigate uh, successfully uh, through and, and gain a Navy contract, which was a, a, a great uh, win for our, our area. With unemployment over 9 percent in my home state of Illinois, every job counts. The bill we have introduced focuses on improving and streamlining 13 mentor protege programs which pair new businesses looking to increase their government contracts with more experienced businesses. The GAO report released last year revealed there are a number of issues that need to be addressed with the mentor-protege program. First, the GAO 
report revealed duplication among programs, creating more unnecessary paperwork for businesses. Secondly, participants re risk losing their small affiliation when working with other businesses. And thirdly, some programs lack accountability. And lastly, the majority of our small businesses do not qualify to participate. H.R. 3985 addresses these issues by placing the SBA in charge of overseeing and setting standards for the 13 existing programs based on the concerns I have just listed. It also requires the SBA to collect data from the agencies regarding the number and types of participants, including the number of hub zone veteran and women-owned businesses. <coughs> data showing the uh, ability of businesses to retain these contracts is also required and must be submitted to Congress. Ultimately, our bill will improve mentor pro protege programs, making it easier for small firms to compete for and win contracts, enabling them to grow, create jobs, and get folks back to work. I uh, thank you for the opportunity and urge members of the committee to support H.R. 3985. I now yield to Ranking Member Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, mentor protege programs have been successfully across 13 federal agencies to enhance the ability of small firms to compete for federal government contracts by furnishing them with assistance to improve their performance. To this point, the GAO reported at a small business committee hearing last year that all, all 13 agencies have established policies and procedures for administering and monitoring their programs. GAO found that agencies have requirements in place to conduct periodic reviews as well as controls to help ensure that mentors and prodigies meet el eligibility criteria and benefit from participation in the program. As a result of GAO findings, it seems to me unnecessary and potentially problematic that the legislation will require the SBA to approve all mentor prodigies programs government-wide. Given SBA's track record of delay and inaction, the agency could effectively shut down these initiatives across the government by merely delaying an approval or disapproval decision. And uh, I want to be on record on this. I do not want uh, to see that uh, this program are shut down and then members will call me or you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to question why is it that we allow for this program uh, to, um, to expire. While the true benefits of this program are uncertain, it is not advisable in this stage of, re of the recovery to discontinue any source of small business support simply because the SBA is unable to act timely to approve otherwise well-functioning mentor prodigy programs as it was substantiated by the GAO report. In fact, the GAO analysis suggests that the programs are operating well without any additional bureaucratic layer of oversight. Plus, given SBA's poor track record of oversight of the hub zone program, it gives me little comfort that we are handing the agency similar responsibility. With these concerns in mind, I hope that the legislation will continue to be improved at its head to the floor. Mentor prodigy programs remain an important resource for many small businesses, enabling them to learn the ropes from more experienced contractors. Improving them is important, but we must make sure that, the future, that future changes do not undermine the very strength of those mentor prodigy programs in existence today. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Do you have any members who wish to be recognized for a statement on H.R. 3985? Mr. Chu. I hear uh, over and over again from small businesses one question, how do I break into federal contracting? With average annual spending at $500 billion, there is no better way for small businesses to expand during these tough times than through federal contracts. Historically, however, it has been difficult for small businesses to gain a toehold in the federal procurement system. To help small businesses gain entry into the federal marketplace, mentor-protege programs were established. This program allows smaller firms the opportunity to work directly with larger vendors. This can provide them with vital experience and lead to future opportunities, which will hopefully lead to getting more federal contracts in the hands of small business. The Building Better Businesses Partnership Act of 2012 will help small 
firms break into Federal contracting by making it easier for them to join mentor-protege programs. This bill will streamline the process by putting these programs under one agency, the SBA, and create better oversight over the programs so that small businesses truly benefit from the agreements. It will address the GAO report is issues by determining how well the program goals have been achieved. Helping small businesses win contracts will help put Americans back to work. And with two out of every three jobs coming from small businesses, this bill will help the true driving force behind America's economy. I ask my colleagues on the Small Business Committee for their support. Thank you, and I yield back. Does any other member wish to be heard on, on the bill? The committee now moves consideration of H.R. 3985. Clerk, please report the title of the bill. H.R. 3985, to amend the Small Business Act with respect to mentor protege programs and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 3985 is considered read and open for amendment at any point. Does anyone have an amendment? I believe, Ms. Chu, you have an amendment. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a perfecting amendment to HR to HR 3985. Clerk, please report the amendment. Amendment one to HR 3985, offered by Ms. Chu of California. Without uh, objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, the gentlelady has five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a perfecting amendment to the Building Better Business Partnerships Act. The amendment clarifies that program regulations must protect protégés against actions that negatively impact them or provide disproportionate benefits to the mentor. It also allows for current mentor-protégé agreements to be grandfathered into the new program until the expiration date of their agreement. The amendment also says that agencies operating mentor-protege programs will be allowed six months after the regulations are transmitted to submit their pro mentor-protege plans and then provide a detailed timeline for SBA's approval of these plans. Finally, the amendment requires a GAO report to assess the impact of the changes to the mentor-protege program. This amendment was crafted with input from the majority and minority sides of the committee and strengthens the language of the bill. I ask for the committee's support. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Schilling. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, just, uh, I believe this is a good amendment that makes H.R. 3985 stronger, uh, more accountable, and further protects small businesses, and I urge members to support Representative Chu's amendment. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Yep. Seeing none, gentlelady's amendment, I think it further, uh, furthers the intention of the bill. Uh, and it was through uh, bipartisan discussions. Uh, with that, I am very pleased to support the general lady's amendment. And the question, the question is on the amendment offered by Ms. Chu. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Suppose no. If any of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes do have it. The amendment is agreed to. Does any other member wish to be recognized for an amendment? Seeing none. <coughs> The question is on agreeing to H.R. 3985 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. It's the opinion of the chairs that the ayes have it. H.R. 3985 is agreed to. Without objection, a quorum being present, the bill is favorably reported to the House. And without objection, the committee staff is authorized to correct punctuation and make other necessary technical changes and conforming changes. Our next bill for consideration is H.R. 3987, the Small Business Protection Act of 2012, which is introduced by Mr. Walsh and Mr. Connolly. Uh, I now yield to Mr. Walsh for, uh, to speak on 3987. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Velasquez. As you know, the SBA has proposed radically new size standards for small business government contracting that don't just alter the size standard for each industry but in some instances actually combine several different industries into a new common group under a single size standard. The problem is that in creating these new common groups, SBA by its own analysis is excluding legitimate small businesses from small business contracting programs and allowing large businesses to participate in the same programs. For example, uh, let, let's look at architecture and engineering firms. SBA's own metrics and analysis shows that architecture firms should have a small business size standard of $7 million and engineering firms of $25.5 million. Yet SBA has decided to combine them into a common group and assign, that, assign them a size standard of $7 million, which is completely inappropriate for either of them. 
in the one instance, it legitimately, it legitimately excludes small businesses from competing for government contracts, and in the other, it forces legitimate small businesses to compete against much larger firms. In fact, the American Institute of Architecture has estimated that this new size standard will include 98 percent of all architecture firms. I think we can all agree that situations like this are not in the best interest of small businesses. After all, size standards do not exist for the ease of the SBA, but for the benefit of America's small businesses. The Small Business Protection Act is simple. It protects legitimate small businesses in government contracting by requiring that the size standard assigned to each new common group is appropriate for each industry included in that group. Without this bill, small businesses, the backbone of the American economy, will be driven out of competition for government contracts, and I yield back. I now uh, recognize Ranking Member Vasquez for opening comment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the complexity of the of size standard is only exceeded by the process in which they are set and revised. Providing greater transparency to this complicated machinery is important. While SBA has recently taken major actions on size standards, this proposal will obviously have no effect on them. However, increasing small businesses' awareness of the size standard process during the proposed rulemaking stage is essential. To this point, it is important that SBA provide the public with a competitive landscape of the affected industry. The approach the agency used to determine the new standard, the source of the agency's data, and the specific impact on the industry, such openness will only enhance small businesses' ability to understand what has become an opaque decision-making process at the agency. Given that size standard determinations can limit firms' ability to secure government contracts, receiving training, or secure financing, it is vital that these decisions are done in the most transparent fashion possible. Bringing sunlight to this uh, shadowy area of the SBA should be a priority. And uh, for that, I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. Does any other member wish to be recognized for a statement on H.R. 3987? Seeing none, I think this bill addresses a central issue to the committee's work, and that is what is a small business. Um, so without objection, uh, would the clerk please report them? H.R. 3987. To amend the Small Business Act with respect to small business concerns, size standards, and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 3987 is considered read and open for amendment. Uh, at any point, does any member have an amendment? I think, Mr. Walsh, you do. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, my amendment makes two. Let, let the clerk report it. Uh, amendment number one. Amendment number one to H.R. 3987, <laughs> offered by Mr. Walsh of Illinois. <clears throat> Thank Without you. objection, the amendment is considered read. The gentleman has five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The amendment makes two small changes to the Small Business Protection Act. First, it requires that the SBA make publicly available its analysis and rationale when revising size standards or creating new ones. Uh, I think we can all agree, as the ranking member said, that more transparency here is a good thing and will help prevent further instances like the one we are correcting here. Second, it prohibits SBA from artificially limiting the number of size standards. Our goal with this entire process is for the SBA to create and maintain the most accurate size standards possible. This amendment keeps the SBA from choosing administrative ease over the correct number of size standards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Seeing none, the amendment was developed through discussions. Yes, Mr. Chairman, oh, yes, I, would like, I would like to say something about this amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this amendment will guarantee SBA uh, that SBA does not try to uh, make the industry fit the size standard, but that an individual size standard will be created for each industry. While the amendment made great strides in trying to guarantee fair process for small businesses, the amendment and corresponding bill still fail to provide an agency appeal process for small businesses if they feel the size standard does not 
adequately represent their industry. Instead, small businesses will be faced with either expending their limited time and money to challenge the size standard or the more likely scenario, accept the standard developed by SBA and be excluded from small business programming. I hope that as we move forward with this piece of legislation and on future bills, we can come up with a meaningful option for small businesses to challenge unfair standards. Thank you. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? The basis of the SBA size standards, size standards I think, should be public so that businesses can better understand the SBA's rationale and challenge it when appropriate. Uh, furthermore, I think SBA shouldn't be allowed uh, to force over 1,100 industries into 16 uh, size standards. Um, the facts, not SBA's administrative ease, should dictate the size of those standards, and I do support uh, the amendment. So with that, the question is on the amendment offered by Mr. Walsh. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. <coughs> the amendment is agreed to. Does any other member wish to offer an amendment? Seeing none, the question is on agreeing to H.R. 3987 as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. H.R. 3987 is agreed to. Without objection, a quorum being present, the bill is favorably reported to the House, and without objection, the committee staff is authorized to correct punctuation, make other necessary technical corrections, and conforming changes. With that, our next bill for consideration is H.R. 4081, the Contractor Opportunity Protection Act of 2012, which I introduced with Mr. West. Um, this bill addresses what may be the top complaint I received from small business contractors, uh, which is contract bundling or the process of taking what could be several small contracts and packaging them together as one large contract that is simply too big for small businesses to compete. Uh, sometimes bundling is justified, in which case it can proceed, but in other cases it ne needlessly shuts down so many small businesses. Uh, th this bill does four things. First, it clarifies the definition of bundling so that we can capture uh, construction contracts. Second, it improves processes by eliminating the needless and duplicative distinctions between bundling and consolidation. And third, it makes the process uh, objective and transparent using boards of contract appeals and government accountability offices existing contracting appeals process to ensure that a neutral third party makes decisions about bundling and it gives small businesses a voice in this process. And finally, it holds agencies accountable. This bill requires agencies to demonstrate that the anticipated savings on bundled uh, contract actually materialize before they continue bundling a successor contract. I want to emphasize that I think this is one of the most important bills uh, that we can pass if we want to help small businesses compete and save taxpayers money, and I urge the committee to support it. Uh, now recognize uh, Ranking Member Velasquez for her Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, it's a good bill, straightforward, and uh, for the longest now, at every meeting that we have done and hearing, uh, in terms of contracting, uh, we hear time and time again how contract bundling and contract consolidation is hurting small businesses. In FY 2011, for instance, more than $50 billion worth of contracts were awarded through bundled or consoli consolidated contracts. To address this, the legislation before us makes several key statutory changes. Most importantly, it expands the definition of what a bundled contract is and requires review by the SBA and procurement center representatives before the proposed procurement could occur, changes that were included in H.R. 1873, which this committee approved in the 110th Congress. Similarly, an appeal process is included that enables both the SBA and affected small businesses to request further action to unbundle contracts. These are positive changes that will help small firms. However, changes to laws without an accompanying increase in enforcement personnel may do more harm than good. And in this regard, there is a glaring lack in oversight when trying to stop contract bundling. While government procurement spending has more than doubled between 2001 and 2010, from $233 billion to $536 billion, resources dedicated to anti-bundling 
efforts have dwindled. So while the statutory changes in this legislation are welcome, it is unfortunately unfortunate that we are not adding more cops on the beat. Don't get me wrong, this legislation makes positive changes, but without adequate enforcement, small businesses will, may be left out without the real change they crave. With that, I, I yield back. <coughs> Are there any other members wish to make a statement on 4081? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you. Um, a question, actually. Um, has any analysis been done to determine whether or not this will increase costs for government agencies if you uh, fail to bundle what would be called small contracts? Barry? Um, not sure I actually understand the question. The concept of contract bundling implies that the Federal agency has done an assessment as to whether or not it is actually saving money by taking contracts that were previously done by small businesses and combining them. So then, in fact, if I am understanding your response, even though you didn't understand my question, <laughs> uh, the, the, um, in fact, they have done an analysis that the bundle is actually cheaper uh, before they would go ahead and bundle. That the con the cons there is nothing that currently in law or that is being made, changes being made in H.R. 4081 prevents the government from bundling. It, pre it prevents the government from bundling when the government doesn't obtain what are called substantial measurable benefits. Those may be cost savings. They may be savings related to the delivery of the product as opposed to necessarily the actual cost savings. In other words, there may be other values that the government captures other than purely cost associated with the savings. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does any member wish to be heard on H.R. 4081? <clears throat> Clerk, please report the title of the bill. H.R. 4081, to amend the Small Business Act to consolidate and revise provisions related to contract bundling and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4081 is considered as read and open for amendment at any point. And I do have an amendment in the nature of a substitute, if the clerk would read the amendment. Amendment 1, amendment in the nature of a substitute, offered by Chairman Graves of Missouri. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. Uh, without objection, the amendment is in the nature of a substitute, um, shall be considered the base text for the purpose of the bill. Does anyone wish to? Or anyone wish to offer an amendment to that? Where are we now? Seeing none, the question is agreeing to H.R. 4081 as amended. All those in favor say aye. All opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. H.R. 4081 is amended. It, as amended, is agreed to, and without objection, a quorum being present, the bill is favorably reported to the House. And without objection, the committee staff is authorized to correct punctuation to make other necessary technical changes and conforming changes. Our next bill for consideration is H.R. 4206, the Contracting Oversight for Small Businesses Job Act of 2012, which was introduced by Mr. Kaufman. And I will now yield to Mr. Kaufman for, uh, to speak on 4206. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm I am very pleased that uh, my legislation, uh, House Resolution 4206, uh, the Oversight for Small uh, Business Jobs Act of 2012, is being included in today's markup. Passage of this legislation will help small businesses comply with complicated size and contracting rules while providing a safe harbor provision for those small businesses which are making a good faith effort to comply uh, with those rules. The bill goes on to establish real penalties for instances of fraud, including suspension or even debarment from eligibility in these programs. Such actions will do a great deal to ensure that only those firms which are truly eligible are taking part in these programs. H.R. 4206 will also raise fraud penalties so that the cost of litigation by the government no longer outweighs possible recovery, further increasing 
the likelihood that bad actors are identified, appropriately dealt with, and the programs can continue to provide valuable income streams to those small businesses which are truly eligible and will benefit. I urge my fellow committee members to support House Resolution 4206, the Oversight for Small Businesses Jobs Act of 2012. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my time. I yield recognize Ranking Member Velasquez for a comment. I congratulate the gentleman on this um, legislation. As we all know, uh, and uh, we uh, witness the GAO report on Hub Zone. Uh, this is the one program uh, that uh, really is being uh, filled with uh, fraud and mismanagement. And we all know that each year across the government, federal agencies are unknowingly victims of contracting fraud. Investigations conducted by the GAO, as well as the SBA's Inspector General, and other agencies have discovered businesses making false statements in order to obtain preferential contracts awards under SBA's small business uh, contracting programs. This has included instances of fraud in the SBA's 8A, Hub Zone, and Service Disabled Veteran programs, some of which were brought to light in testimony before this committee. These instances have become more brazen and not only steal money from honest small businesses, but also the taxpayers. Stopping this behavior and making sure that these individuals cannot do business with the government is vital. By increasing penalties for companies who knowingly misrepresent their status as a small business, we are helping the small firms who play by the rules and who should be rightfully competing for these awards. Strengthening the consequences will make would-be fraudsters think twice about scamming, scamming the government. Maintaining the integrity of the procurement process is a priority, and through weeding out bad actors, we can ensure that small businesses and the taxpayers are not taken advantage of. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Does the other member have a statement on H.R. 4206? Seeing none, the committee now moves to consideration of H.R. 4206. Oh, did I? I'm, I have an I'm sorry. Amendment. We got to open it up. So hang on. Um, committee, will you please read the, or clerk read the report, the title of the bill? H.R. 4206 to amend the Small Business Act to provide for increased penalties for contracting fraud and for other purposes. Without objection, H.R. 4206 is considered as read and open for amendment. Um, at any point. Does a member wish to or have an amendment? And I know now you're ready. Would the clerk please report the amendment? Amendment 1 to H.R. 4206, offered by Ms. Hahn of California. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. The gentlelady has five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member <clears throat> Velasquez, uh, and thank you to Mr. Kaufman for introducing this legislation. I think this is an important step towards ensuring that small businesses who are awarded government contracts are actually small businesses. Just yesterday, this committee held a hearing on entrepreneurship where we learned, among other things, that immigrants were more than twice as likely to start businesses as non-immigrants and that Latinos demonstrated the highest entrepreneurial activity uh, in 2010, which is a good thing for this country. And given the importance of this bill and the surge in Latino business owners, it only makes sense to require that the SBA to publish the Small Business Compliance Guide in Spanish as well as English. That's why I'm offering my amendment to H.R. 4206, the Contracting Oversight for Small Business Jobs Act of 2012, which simply requires that all of the regulations and guides the SBA will produce as a result of this act be made in Spanish. Many of the bills we are marking up today aim to increase government contracts to small businesses and to help them succeed. My amendment is a simple way, a simple step, to make sure that these new business owners can comply with the new rules and regulations. Just before I came in here, I ran into the California uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. They are walking the halls of Congress today, and I am sure uh, that they would agree with this simple step and would urge uh, this committee to accept my amendment. Thank you very much. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Herb Butler. 
I, uh, I thank the chairman and the gentlelady for, for offering the amendment. The only question I would have, I guess it a, is a question for uh, the sponsor, if this is, if I can do that, um, is what would you say, and as the first Hispanic to represent Washington State in the federal government, um, this is an issue near and dear to my heart, what would you say then if there were other groups who come forward and ask for this in their language? I mean, it, 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 I am wondering about the slippery slope. Well, uh, the greatest slippery slope we could have uh, in this country is more, uh, more people uh, starting their own businesses, uh, expanding, hiring, uh, and really turning this economy around. Uh, the only reason I introduced this specific language was because of what we heard in this committee uh, as Latinos having the highest entrepreneurial activity in 2010. And I certainly would be open uh, to uh, you know, other languages as well. I think anything we can do to empower uh, folks in this country to succeed. I would uh, agree. And, and reclaiming my and time on that, um, I think the most important thing we yeah. can do is set up um, people who are, who are coming here to obtain the American dream, set them up to succeed. And one of the ways that I found in my family is making sure that they are able um, to, to start their business and serve customers. Um, and one of the ways that they can do that is making sure that they, they have the support that they need and, and obviously speaking um, and, and being able to communicate in different languages. Obviously, they're not going to learn every language of someone who walks into their door. But I just, uh, I, I would agree, the goal is to support them. And in, in considering this, um, that's how I'm going to look at it. What's going to best set up any immigrant family who wants to come here and take hold of the American dream? What's going to set them up for success? So with that, I yield back. Would the gentle lady yield for a second? Okay. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <clears throat> I uh, want to speak in strong support of the amendment and thank the gentle lady from California for raising this really important issue. And uh, I come from a district where the Latino community has played a very important role in rebuilding the economy of Rhode Island. And uh, recently hosted the administrator of the Small Business Administration to Rhode Island, and she too spoke about uh, nationally the entrepreneurial power and productivity of the Latino community. And uh, what, when I think in particular this bill, which involves the imposition of pretty serious penalties for noncompliance, that in this area in particular we should be sure that people are communicated with uh, in, a, in, in a way that most effectively shares really vital information which has in it penalties of a million dollars. Yeah. And so I would say to the general lady that if there's another community um, you know, next year or the following year that is, is present in the growing uh, entrepreneurial sector of our economy, we ought to be prepared to be sure that that community has this information in their language as well. I think this is the, the beauty of Congress meeting regularly. We have the ability to respond to emerging new communities and new languages, and it's one of the great strengths of our country. But I think there, it is indisputable that in this moment, the Latino community is playing a very powerful and important and growing and uh, significant role in the development of new businesses. And when we are about to enact a set of penalties for non-compliance with those which are very severe, then I think we have to go the extra mile to be sure that they're getting that information um, uh, effectively, and in this case, in their own language. So I applaud the gentlelady for, from California for her visionary thinking in this matter. I yield back the balance of my time. <coughs> Mr. Kaufman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the government contracting is highly technical and requires a, a master of English. Uh, we, we are, nobody here is saying that these proposals are not going to be are going to be submitted in other languages other than English, and so I think it's an unnecessary cost uh, to to have it in a, in a, a, a different language than what we're requiring the submission to be in. Uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of uh, the gentle lady's uh, amendment and. Um, I am even open uh, to contemplate uh, including other languages. You know, at a time when the economy continues to struggle, and we know that immigrants are an important, they play an important role in our economy, it will be, uh, uh, we should do everything we can um, to open the opportunities, uh, the door of opportunity for uh, immigrants, entrepreneurs, 
to participate in the federal marketplace. It's not only about knowing the penalties if they uh, apply for uh, an award where they do not qualify because of their uh, size, but uh, for them to understand what is needed in order to qualify as a small business concern. Um, between 2002 and 2007, the number of Hispanic-owned businesses in the United States increased by 43.7 percent to 2.3 million, more than twice <coughs> the national rate of 18 percent. Hispanic-owned businesses, for example, generated $345.2 billion in sales in 2007, up 55 percent, 0.5 percent, compared with 2005. And this overall trend in Hispanic-owned businesses is likely to continue, as the Census Bureau reported that the U.S. Hispanic population surged 43 percent, rising to 50.5 percent uh, million in 2010 from 35 million. Furthermore, an estimated uh, 45 million of this demographic speak Spanish. And I will ask the gentle lady uh, uh, who spoke before uh, that maybe we could work together to make sure that resources are included when we are reauthorizing ESL uh, programs so that the money, the resources are there for those who want to learn English. And believe me, they do. But resources are not there for them to have, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, be able to have the uh, English language uh, classes that they need. As the Hispanic population continues to grow, this amendment will ensure that Hispanic-owned businesses have the information necessary to determine whether or not they qualify. And with that, I yield back. Ms. Elmers. I have a question, um, and it's a very simple. What, is there a cost associated with this, and do we know that number? And I, I guess it would be to the gentlelady who has put forward the amendment. Thank you. Uh, I, at this time, don't have a, a, a cost estimate of what this would require. But, you know, again, uh, I think this is an um, important step that we can take uh, to let uh, entrepreneurs, let small business uh, folks out there in this country know that we're on their side, and and again, uh, what we're enacting today could uh, cost uh, penalties up to a million dollars for some of these small business owners, which I'm sure they would argue is not something uh, th that uh, would be welcome at a time when they're trying to get get started. So we want them to be in compliance. And, you know, current law is vague on what documents must be made available in a language other than English and what constitutes a vital document. So I just think that this in ensures that our policy matches the facts. Uh, and um, I think what we want to do in this committee is, again, be on the side of small businesses. We, we want to empower them. We want to make sure that they're in compliance uh, with, with federal government regulations. And so I think this is an important amendment. And it's a simple one. Reclaim your time. I, I just want to comment then that we, we don't know the cost associated with this, and, and I think that is something that we need to consider. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Hanna. We passed legislation before where the chairman said that he didn't do the study. Mr. Hanna. Um, if I could ask the gentlelady, uh, Ms. Peters. Why isn't the overwhelming success of the Hispanic community's growth evidence that this isn't necessary? Well, again, this is because what we're uh, we're enacting uh, a, a new law here, so uh, it, it has nothing to do with previously whether or not uh, Latinos have been have shown that great. Uh, American entrepreneurial um, uh, passion. This is that we're enacting a new law that could impact them, and I think it uh, mm -hmm. is only fair uh, mm -hmm. and right that we, uh, well, what I'm suggesting we translate is that this they, in, in their own language. I appreciate that, but uh, what I'm suggesting is that, that, that it's actually evidence to the contrary, that the people are quite capable of managing within the rules that we have. Clearly, there's a lot to be read, a lot to be done, a lot to be studied, and it's obviously going well. I guess your point would be that they would do even better. Maybe. 
Well, I, I just think it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to, when we enact in a, law, a law like this to uh, have it published in Spanish. So, I come from California. This is, sure. We do this all the time, so it, right. it's interesting to uh, have this debate where others don't agree with this. Uh, well, this is like second nature for us, uh, particularly in Los Angeles. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, are you back? Mr. West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to ask the uh, gentlelady from uh, California, do we have the technical manuals for C-17 aircraft in other languages than English? I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you no. Do you have the technical manuals for an F-15, F-16 aircraft or, uh, you know, helicopters in other languages than English? Well, you know, I, I don't really see this as being I, I do because subject. this is the point. Uh, if you are a crew chief on these aircraft, you're responsible for that aircraft. If that aircraft were to crush, we're talking about multi-millions of dollars in penalties. So if we are not producing, you know, technical manuals, federal government, United States military, in languages other than English, then why do we need to produce uh, this in a language other than English? So uh, I, I think that the precedent is established. We have one language uh, that we operate in, the, uh, the federal government, and that's uh, English. And uh, what the, Cal the state of California wants to do, that's fine. I can tell you in the state of Florida, in South Florida, that uh, election ballots are printed in three different languages, and that's Spanish, Creole, and English. That's something that they do in South Florida that the federal government has not mandated. So I don't think that this uh, should be mandated from this committee or as part of this legislation. So I uh, will be voting no on this amendment. And I, I just wanted to, if, if, you may, if I may, reply that, uh, again, this is not uh, military contracts we're talking about here. Uh, this is small business uh, contracts. They are. And yeah, they are. Well, I mean, this is, you know, th we're talking about a document here that we're considering a vital document. Uh, and uh, according to our policy, a vital document uh, can be translated in another language. Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I would just start off by noting uh, to the gentlelady that uh, some of the resistance that, that you're hearing here from our side, um, I think we want to be welcoming to those uh, folks that are here legally in this country. And I know the folks in California are oftentimes trend centers, and the rest of us sometimes follow along. Um, but the business, the business of this country is generally conducted in English, and that's been accepted for a long time. Uh, I, many of us here favor English as the official language of our country, and I happen to favor that as well. We, we also think that it's in the best interest of groups as quickly as possible um, to learn the language of this country. Uh, to learn English, uh, and they'll be far better off, whether it's in the schools or whether it's in the business community or other. Uh, many of us believe that you're un unfortunately holding folks back uh, by having exceptions in, in different languages. Um, they're much better off in the long term. I think there are a number of studies that show this. Uh, if they learn the language now uh, and operate in that language, and, and, uh, uh, and, and I think that this this particular amendment uh, is in opposition to that. So that's, I, I think that's what you're hearing, is at least some of the resistance on, on this side. We think people are much better off learning the language uh, of this country, and they'll be much further ahead much more quickly if, if they do that. I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chair. I move the previous question. Um, Mr. Chair, I, hmm. we, <laughs> I, if the previous question has been moved, but you know, this is such an interesting debate. It is. Um, the thing is, we're running out of time, and I'd like to get, we've got one more bill to do, but I don't want to cut anybody off. I want anybody to be able to speak that, that wants to speak. Um, but we are running out of time. We've got Ms. Chu, um, we've got Ms. Clark, and we've got Mr. Uh, Bartlett. Uh, Ms. Chu, if you can, please. Yeah, uh, Ms. Chu, uh, I'd like to uh, yield to uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. I thank the gentlelady. I, I just want to say that I think, um, it's important in this discussion to recognize that by uh, suggesting that this amendment, which would require that this information be provided to people in Spanish, does not mean every document, including airplane manuals or every ballot. This, we're talking about, in particular, how we help small businesses. And it is irrefutable, when you look at the evidence, the role that new immigrants play in the startup new, new businesses, 
the role that new residents to our country play in beginning and growing jobs as a part of creating new businesses. There is a, there's a special role that new immigrants or immigrants to this country, often who don't speak English, particularly who speak Spanish, are playing in job creation. And so it is very different than, of course, I think everyone would agree, it is easier if you move to a country when you learn that language and you are able to integrate fully with the language of that country. That, that, of course, that is everyone's hope and it, that will certainly be terrific. But, but what, what we are really asking is what is best for our country in these early years and if there is someone who speaks Spanish and they are going to start a new business or grow a business, being sure that they have information which includes a very serious penalty makes sense. And it's, you know, to, to suggest that by doing that, we are arguing that every plane manual or every ballot also has to be in Spanish. That is not the argument. This is a population that is starting new businesses. If you look at the statistics of what is the percentage of, of new business in this country that are being started, particularly in urban areas, by new immigrants, that people have been here less than a couple of years, it is staggering. It is the engine of the small business economy in this country. And to suggest somehow we should not do everything we can to share information with that community in their own language that has very serious penalties, I think fundamentally ignores reality, the reality of the Latino presence in the small business economy of this country. And um, I urge people to, be, to separate out this notion that we can't do it in this one area without doing it everywhere in government for every group. We have the ability to discern situations one from the other, and I think this one makes good common sense, not only for the community that we are reaching here that speaks Spanish, but for all of us who benefit from the growth of jobs in these new businesses, in Latino businesses all across this country. And with that, I uh, yield back the balance of my time. All right, yield back Mr. to the Bartlett. Lady. Thank you. Sorry. I am really conflicted on this amendment. I have been a very long time supporter of uh, English first. It is the language of commerce in our country. If you do not ultimately learn English, you will be relegated to uh, generally to uh, entry level kinds of jobs. And so I think that uh, uh, it is essential that we encourage people to learn English. But English first doesn't mean English only. That's right. And I would um, be more supportive of this amendment if it said that we would provide in digital form for downloading a Spanish translation though, so that those who needed it could, could uh, get it. I understand the concern of many of those. Right, I, like, I like that. Okay. Well, if I could make a friendly, uh, That's friendly. perfecting amendment to your amendment, I would suggest that we provide this in digital form for downloading. And I think that does away with almost all the objections on our side. I love it. I will I'll, I'll accept that friendly amendment. If we could do that, I think that would uh, help to advance this. So moved. We're going to have um, to, Mr. Chairman, may I offer an Brian. amendment to that? Well, no, because that'd be in the third degree. But um, <laughs> the uh, we're going to have to have it in writing to be able to uh, to do it. So we're going to have to to recess um, to be able to do that. Mr. Chairman, I wonder if we could agree that before this goes to the floor, that we will uh, work to uh, to improve this. Well, so that we sh she might now withdraw her amendment with the. Uh, I'm not with going her, to support uh, the amendment. Um, so we can. Um, I mean, I'd love to support the gentlelady, but I cannot support this amendment. Um, Even in download, withdraw your. Or do you want to recess and and we'll come back? Oh, can we simply move to the last one and they can yeah. work this while we're doing the last the bill and then it'll come back and. I would Irma, maybe we should move to the next bill and yeah. uh, let them work on the yeah. language of that. Thank you. Amendment. Yeah. Uh, being in writing can be in handwriting, can it not? Yes. 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 Okay. But we need to get, get copies of the answer. To okay. Yes. So, uh, Thank you, and I yield back. Pursuant to Rule 10 of the Mr. committee. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Ms. Clark, you want to be heard? Yes, I would. Thank amendment. you, sir. I just wanted to uh, <clears throat> add my voice. I, my colleague, Mr. Hanna, raised a, a question about the fact that we recognize that so many um, just Hispanic businesses already exist and are already being successful. But what is implied in there is that all of these businesses are doing business with the SBA. Um, that is not accurate. What we are trying to do is encourage these businesses to grow. And many of them are mom and pop establishments. 
um, as most small businesses start out. Once these businesses have reached a certain size, they are often um, seeking ways to grow. And during that interim period, these are immigrants who are learning English. I think um, there is a misrepresentation here that people aren't multitasking. I think the very first thing that immigrants who speak another language try to do is, particularly when they want to go into business, is to begin learning the English language as, as best they can. The, the challenge is interpreting information. And there is oftentimes not a direct translation of how to do business with the U.S. government. What this uh, amendment would do is clarify and remove the barriers to the understandings and the complexities of doing business with the federal government, which I believe would certainly help these businesses to expand and to become employers of many Americans across the nation. I think this is a small price to pay when you look at the success of these businesses. Um, it, that is to provide a, a way for them to interpret our laws uh, in keeping with uh, the language uh, that is their first language, while at the same time learning uh, the, uh, the, the native language of this nation, which has been English, and uh, uh, helping them, therefore, to, to move forward. So I, I just wanted to correct an assumption that was sort of built into your statement, Mr. Hanna. Many of these businesses already operate. They have just never done business with the government. And this is a way of building a bridge uh, to their access to the programs that we know will help them to expand and become employers uh, in our nation. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will withdraw my perfecting amendment. Oh. Does any other member wish? <laughs> does any other wish member wish to be heard on the amendment? Any other member wish to be heard on the amendment? Uh, yes. With that, uh, I want to kind of. I'd like to offer that perfecting amendment in uh, the substitution, if, that, if I may, Mr. Chairman. I think it's an excellent suggestion that the sponsor. We need it. We need it in writing. Pardon me. We need it in writing. We need it in writing. Can we download it? English. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment, and then we're going to postpone proceedings? Come on, Mr. Chairman, can we can we handwrite? Yes. Yes. Okay. We're going to. Are you doing it right now? Yes. What we'll do, pursuant to Rule Ten of the committee's rules, proceedings on the amendment will be postponed, and we're going to come. We're going to come right back to it just as soon as we do uh, the next bill, which is H.R. 4203, the Women's Procurement Act of 2012, which is introduced by R Ranking Member Velazquez. And I now recommend or uh, recognize uh, Ms. Velazquez for her opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The federal government has a 5 percent procurement goal for women owned businesses established in 1994 that has never been achieved. In fact, last year the government missed the goal by more than 20 percent. As a result, one of the primary obstacles facing women-owned businesses over the last 10 years has been the government's failure to implement the women's procurement program. Last year, that obstacle was finally removed as the final regulations for the women's procurement program were released and the program was implemented. Through this program, women-owned small businesses are now eligible for contracts through restricted competition in 83 industries that have historically had underutilization of women-owned businesses. However, the program is far from perfect. While parity among small businesses contracting programs was achieved two years ago, the women's procurement still lags behind. Simply put, contracting officers do not have the options under the women's procurement program that they do under the HUBSOM, 8A, and Service Disabled Veterans Initiatives. To address these issues and maintain parity, the bill gives federal agencies new tools to award contracts to women on businesses similar to those that already exist. 
for the AA Hubzone and Service Disabled Veterans Program. For restricted competitions, the Act will remove the existing caps on contracts eligible for set aside, putting the program on par with other small businesses contracting programs. Together, these changes support effort to maintain parity among all SBA contracting programs while giving contracting officers another tool to make awards to these type of companies. There is another key problem that is holding back the program. The status call for businesses to certify their eligibility for the program and for these certifications to be verified by either agency contracting officers or third parties. What has happened is that the agency procurement officers have now become the de facto certifiers, a tedious and exacting role that is causing delays in the program's rollout. These procurement officers should not be verifying certifications. Instead, they should be working with small businesses to award them contracts. Making matters worse, the SBA requested inadequate resources to support these certifications, making the document repository, eligibility examinations, and protest process nearly unworkable. To address these issues, the legislation charges SBA with the responsibility of certifying participants. If SBA is unable to do so, SBA may continue to approve third-party certifiers to carry out such responsibility. The truth of the matter is that this is SBA responsibility and they need to step up to, step up to the plate and certify women-owned businesses for this program to succeed. Frankly, I think we are growing tired of the agency's excuses that it is someone else's job to certify eligibility for the agency's very own programs. Strengthening the women's procurement program is critical to the 7.8 million women-owned businesses in the United States, making up nearly 30 percent of all businesses across the country and generating $1.2 trillion in revenue. They are a fast-growing sector of the economy, ensuring that they have access to compete for government contracts is essential for their continued growth. And I urge a yes vote on this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Are there any other members who wish to be recognized for a statement on Ranking Members H.R. 4203? Seeing none, I support 4203. Uh, in our last markup, I said that I didn't want to pick winners and losers, but rather ensure that all small businesses have the opportunity to compete for contracts. Standardizing the various small business programs to the extent possible helps meet that objective, and I particularly support removing the caps on competitive contracts. If we believe in the market, why would we say that when multiple firms are competing, we need to cap the size of the award? I think competition will keep price, the price reasonable, and the contracting officer is required to certify that the price the government is paying is fair and reasonable. I do urge the committee to support the bill. Uh, Committee now moves consideration of H.R. 4203. Clerk, please report the title. H.R. 4203, to amend the Small Business Act with respect to the procurement program for women-owned small business concerns and for other purposes. Without objection, 4203 is considered as read and open for amendment. Does any member have an amendment? Seeing none, the question on is, agreeing, is on agreeing to H.R. 4203. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. If any of the chairs, the ayes have it. The ayes do have it. H.R. 4203 is agreed to. And without objection, a quorum being present, the bill is favorably reported to the House. And without objection, the committee staff is authorized to correct punctuation and make other necessary technical changes. <coughs> still waiting on copies. All right, we are waiting on the copies. The committee previously postponed action on H.R. 4206. <coughs> as soon as we have the copies, we will move forward. How long is it going to take? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. There we go. The committee previously postponed action on H.R. 4206. Without objection, we will now resume uh, these discussions. The gentleman wished to offer a protect, per, the gentleman wished to offer a perfecting amendment. The amendment has or is being distributed. Um, the clerk will report the amendment to the amendment. 
Amendment offered by Mr. Cislany of Rhode Island, perfecting Amendment 1 to H.R. 4206, offered by Ms. Hahn of California. With that, does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment to the amendment? Yeah, I just, I just, I just want to say again, as uh, we are really working to, to protect and support job creators, that was really the intention of uh, this, this amendment. And I think having it, download, having it being available uh, to be downloaded really um, gets rid of the idea that it will cost uh, more in the long run. Any other, member, any other member wish to be heard on the amendment to the amendment? Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Graves. I just wanted to, uh, again, share with my colleagues my support for this amendment and its perfecting amendment. Um, I think that we have come to a great compromise here. Uh, there are a host of small businesses that are growing across our nation that really rely on us uh, to be helpful to them. Um, I know of the concerns of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Um, it is my hope that this perfecting amendment, which provides this online, uh, will uh, ease any concerns that our colleagues would have. Again, it has been my experience that uh, most immigrants really desire uh, to learn the English language, particularly those who are involved in commerce. They want to be able to uh, pitch their services, their products and their wares uh, to every American. And they recognize that anything that is a barrier to that is a barrier to their success. So my, my uh, support for this amendment is a bridge building amendment that enables those who would like to use the services of the Federal Government to expand their businesses, to become employers to all Americans, to have this translation available that enables them to accurately understand what is required by the SBA of them uh, to strengthen, build, and um, to further their pursuits of, of the American dream. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And the member wish to be heard on the amendment to the amendment. We are going to have votes in five minutes. Does any other member wish to be heard on the amendment to the amendment? Uh, seeing none, I am going to uh, I'm going to oppose both. I don't, do not support the underlying amendment. I am not going to support the amendment to the amendment. I believe translating the compliance guidelines into another language is just going to be money that, that uh, is going to be spent uh, without actually benefiting. Um, you know, this is the tenth government contracting bill we've marked up, and in the last night have shown us, if anything, that government contracting is a very technical area. And I'm going to back up what Mr. Kaufman uh, said earlier. You know, when dealing with something technical, the choice of words matter, and a common la language allows us to use words with precision. And in the case of com compliance guidelines, that precision is especially important because it is a legal document. <laughs> the underlying documents themselves are only available in English. The Federal Acquisition Regulation is 2,000 pages, over 2,000 pages of regulation that all government contractors need to understand, and it is only available in, language, in English. Solicitations are only available in English. Government contracts themselves are only available uh, in English. And I think the amendment actually does very little to help small businesses, and it is going to add to, uh, add to the cost. Therefore, I am opposing the amendment to the amendment and the underlying amendment. Um, and with that, the question is on. The amendment offered by Mr. Cicilline uh, to the amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chairman, can we have a recorded vote? <clears throat> recorded vote has been requested. Clerk, please uh, call the roll. Chairman Graves? No. Chairman Graves votes no. Mr. Bartlett? Yes. Mr. Bartlett votes aye. Mr. Shabbat? No. Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. King? Mr. King. Mr. Kaufman. No. Mr. Kaufman votes no. Mr. Mulvaney. No. Mr. Mulvaney votes no. Mr. Tipton. Aye. Mr. Tipton votes aye. Mr. Landry. Mr. Landry. Ms. Herrera Butler. No. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mr. West. No. Mr. West votes no. Mrs. Elmers. No. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Walsh. No. Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Barletta? No. Mr. Barletta votes no. Mr. Hanna? Yes. Mr. Hanna votes aye. Mr. Schilling? Yes. Mr. Schilling votes aye. Very good. 
Ranking Member Velasquez? Yes. Ranking Member Velasquez votes aye. Mr. Schrader? Aye. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Critz? Aye. Mr. Critz votes aye. Ms. Chu? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Clark? Aye. Ms. Clark votes aye. Ms. Chu? Aye. Ms. Chu votes aye. Mr. Cicilline? Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond? Ms. Hahn? Aye. Ms. Hahn votes aye. Mr. Peters? Aye. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Keating? Yes. Mr. Keating votes aye. Does any member wish to vote? Any member wish to change your vote? Fourteen ayes, nine noes. Oh. On this vote, the ayes are 14, the noes are 9, the amendment is, or the amendment to the amendment is agreed to. The question is now on the underlying amendment by Ms. Hahn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. Penny the chair, the noes have it. Do we have a recorded vote on that as well? A recorded well? vote has been requested. Will the clerk please call the roll. Chairman Graves? No. Chairman Graves votes no. Mr. Bartlett? Aye. Mr. Bartlett votes aye. Mr. Chabot? No. Mr. Chabot votes no. Mr. King? Mr. King? Mr. Kaufman? No. Mr. Kaufman votes no. Mr. Mulvaney? No. Mr. Mulvaney votes no. <laughs> Mr. Tipton? Aye. Mr. Tipton votes aye. Mr. Landry? Mr. Landry? Ms. Herrera Butler? No. Ms. Herrera Butler votes no. Mr. West? No. Nope. Mr. West votes no. Mrs. Elmers? No. Mrs. Elmers votes no. Mr. Walsh? No. Mr. Walsh votes no. Mr. Barletta? No. Mr. Barletta votes no. Mr. Hanna? No. Mr. Hanna votes no. Mr. Schilling? No. Mr. Schilling votes no. Ranking Member Velasquez? Aye. Ranking Member Velasquez votes aye. Mr. Schrader? Aye. Mr. Schrader votes aye. Mr. Critz? Mr. Critz votes aye. Ms. Clark? Ms. Clark votes aye. Ms. Chu? Ms. Chu votes aye. Mr. Cicilline? Aye. Mr. Cicilline votes aye. Mr. Richmond? Mr. Richmond? Ms. Hahn? Aye. Ms. Hahn votes aye. Mr. Peters? Aye. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Keating? Yes. Mr. Keating votes aye. Does a member wish to change their vote? Seeing none. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, as a point of clarification, uh, by voting on this on um, Ms. Hans amendment, um, it is uh, it, it, we are voting on an amendment that was uh, voted on Cicilline, uh, and so the vote on this amendment, uh, uh, what it does, it 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 makes sure that. Mr. Cicilline's amendment uh, takes precedent over Ms. Hahn's amendment, isn't it? No, it was Hans a. Yeah, Mr. Hahn or Ms. Hahn's amendment's been amended. Yeah. So in but, fact, they're voting on on the language of uh, Mr. Cicilline. Well, they're voting on the language of Ms. Hahn. It's been amended by Mr. Cicilline. Clerk, please report that. Twelve eyes, eleven noes. What was it? Twelve eyes, eleven noes. On this vote, the on this vote, the ayes are 12, the noes are 11. The amendment is agreed to. Um, with that, the question is on HR 4206, as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. HR 4206 is agreed to without objection. A quorum it being present, the bill is favorably reported to the House without objection. Committee staff is authorized to correct punctuation, make other necessary technical corrections, and conforming uh, changes. With that, that's all of the. Uh, that's the five bills. Um, thanks for everybody being here. Hearings adjourned.